Last week, we left the Apostle Paul after he taught us how to deal with our antagonists. Anybody in this room have any antagonists, people who antagonize you? And this is what Paul was dealing with while he was imprisoned in Rome. And his, ta- his antagonists come as a bit of a surprise because when we think of Christian leaders and we think of antagonists, we often think of non-believers. But Paul's antagonists, probably the ones whose words had the most power in his life, were believers. Uh, They were people, men, who were building their careers and reputation at Paul's expense. And in Paul's case, they were uh, men who were effectively winning new converts to the faith, but did so motivated by selfish ambition, such as jealousy and envy. They did so uh, at the expense of Paul's reputation. And what was Paul's response to this? He writes to the church in Philippi that he is rejoicing because whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed. In other words, Paul is saying, look, it's not about me. Uh, It's about Jesus. Christ and his reputation is my main concern. Paul communicates. Uh, I am not going to respond to these immature pastors. And remember, in those days, everyone was a new Christian. For all practical purposes, almost all of Christendom were babes in Christ, even the leaders. He said, I am not going to respond to these immature Christian preachers by attacking them and doing even more damage to the bride of Christ than they are already doing. Christ is choosing to work through them, and regardless of their weaknesses, I choose to be joyful as I see Christ at work in them. Now, I hear that and I say, that's godly counsel. That is not where my mind would go first as I responded to antagonists. However, Perhaps you, like me, at the end of last week's sermon, uh, felt like things weren't over yet. More needed to be said. It's still, there's still a struggle going on inside me. And I found myself identifying with Paul's predicament. It wasn't fair what was happening to him. My sense of justice doesn't like it. What about this persecuted brother? He is in prison. He is being belittled. He is being humiliated by both believers and non-believers. But what about Paul? How could he cope? And the important question for us this morning is how can we learn about coping in the prisons that we find ourselves in? Now, if you are here you're probably not, you're not locked up in a prison unless you're in a Huber program here in town. That might be true with some of you. Uh, but I contend that most of us, from time to time, and some people, by their own twisted personal preferences, are in prison a lot of the times. And it's a mental prison. It's a spiritual prison. Uh, prisons of the mind. Thoughts that we cannot escape that drag us down and hurt us and affect the people around us in negative ways. Sometimes we're in prisons of relationships that are harmful to us and to others. Or sometimes we're in a prison because of lack of relationships that we desire. And the thoughts that are generated because of loneliness put us in a type of prison. Sometimes people fall into prisons of guilt. And you can can name the various things that occupy our thoughts and our minds in unhealthy ways, perhaps because of trauma that has gone on at some time in the past. So what do we do when we find ourselves in these prisons? And I believe that the way Paul is going to respond to his tormentors, to his antagonists, uh, 
is what helped free him from the prisons of his own mind, even though he was literally incarcerated in uh, a Roman prison. Now, first thing that Paul, well, let's, let's, uh, let's look at the portion of Scripture we want to hit this morning. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Take your Bibles, join me there. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Paul has said that he rejoices that the gospel is being preached. And then the end of verse 18, as it lines up in most Bibles, depending on how the, uh, how the men who put verses and line them up or what translation you're using, he reinforces his joy. He says, yes, I will rejoice, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, when Paul says, my deliverance, what do, we, what do we immediately think he's talking about? Don't we think about the prison in Rome, the physical prison he's in? Okay. I contend that it's far more than that. Okay. And I, we, I take that contention by what it says in the rest of this, uh, rest of this portion of Scripture. Uh, this will turn out for my deliverance, as is my eager expectation and my hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by my death. For to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, this is a wonderful portion of Scripture, the Lord, that your Spirit has used to lift the hearts of believers for centuries. So much power in these words, so much wisdom. Wisdom, Lord, knowledge, truth that will carry us through the elements of our lives and on into eternity. Lord, I pray for every soul, every mind in this room, Lord, that we will begin to grasp this in its wholeness, Lord. So it will change us and change the way that we view every element of our lives so that we can see it, Lord, the way that you see it for our good and for the good of others, Lord, that you place in our lives. We give this to you, Lord. We give this time to you, our minds, our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. First thing Paul points out is that he is not alone. He is not alone. This is, one of the reasons, this is one of the ways that he copes. He says he has confidence in the prayers of the saints, knowing that other Christians are praying for him, and that helps him. Uh, believers, uh, he knew that Christians were praying for him in two ways. One, from reports that he had gotten. In other words, he would get people who would come and visit him and say, uh, Paul, the, the church in Philippi is praying for you, or Paul, the church in Corinth is praying for you, or Paul, the church in Macedonia is praying for you. So he knew that there were people out there praying for him. When they were praying for him, he knew that he was in their hearts and in their minds. Uh, and what did he glean from those prayers? And I contend that he gleaned a sense of their presence and comfort and strength and peace. Okay, now, why do I contend that? Because the text doesn't say that with clarity. Well, I say that with clarity because when I knew that people were praying for me intensely, that's what I gleaned from it. How many of you who have received the prayers of the saints would agree with me that when you have a consciousness that people are praying for you, you're conscious of their presence, you're conscious of comfort and strength and peace? Just raise your hand as a testimony. Okay, when people have prayed, you have sensed those things. And don't ask me to explain it. I can't fully explain it. It is something spiritual that God does in the hearts of his people, no doubt through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. So who prayed for Paul? And I would contend that the people who prayed for him were the, those obedient saints who prayed in obedience to what their pastor told them to pray. You think that's true? I would say the obedient saints who prayed for Paul were the saints who prayed in obedience to the leading of the Spirit that lived within them. Would you agree with that? 
Because the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us in all truth. And it's the Holy Spirit that guides us to pray. One of the things that I learned from one of my Pentecostal brothers was that sometimes if you wake up in the middle, if, how many have ever had where you woke up in the middle of the night, you didn't know why you woke up, but somebody was on your mind? Just raise your hand. Okay. I had an Uncle David who was a B-17 pilot in World War II, and uh, he was on the Schweinfurt bombing mission. Those of you who know World War II history know that Schweinfurt was a huge bombing mission where hundreds of B-17s were taken out of the sky. And David ended up coming back safely from that mission, and when he got home, uh, he went back to London, he immediately got on the phone, and he called my grandmother. <laughs> and he said, Ma... Were you praying for me? And then he, at the time of the mission, he told her when he was. And she said, oh, I woke up in the middle of the night, compelled to pray with you, and I prayed for you the whole evening. Okay? The Lord, okay, compelled her, woke her up in the middle of the night to pray for her son. On that bombing run, his, he had one of his crew members killed and his co-pilot was killed. Okay? Uh... I say this because I don't want some of you to worry about who or how many people are praying for you. Okay? Every once in a while, people uh, get angry about these things. And I think it's more a matter of you trusting the Lord to do his work on your behalf. I've seen too many Christians become angry at other Christians or even depressed because they didn't believe certain people were praying for them that they thought ought to be praying for them. And I want to say this rather gently, and I want to be sensitive to each of you, but it isn't up to anybody in this room to decide who should be praying for you. It's certainly not up to you to decide who should be praying for you. That is the Lord's work. <laughs> And just because you prayed for somebody else a lot, that doesn't put them in prayer debt to you. Okay? Rather than, by the way, every once in a while, you, you get emails requesting you to pray for people. Sometimes you've never heard of them. You don't know who they are, but they paint a very, very bleak picture of someone who is usually in a lot of trouble. And it's a very, they come across as very godly and people who just love this person who needs prayer so bad. And, uh, and then at the end it says, pass this prayer request on to 10 of your friends or curse you, you know. <laughs> uh, and they, they're, they're operating off this, this pretense that the more people who pray for you, the more likely you are to have your prayers answered. Is that, does, can anybody give me a verse in the Bible that teaches that? that the more people who pray for you, the more likely the prayer is going to be answered. Did anybody? I mean, I've looked. I can't find it. Okay? And frankly, I think what that's doing is usurping God's role, God's authority. It's, this, is, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? We don't decide those things. What we do is we, with gratitude, say thank you for the prayers that are prayed that God has made available on our behalf. That's what Paul did. Rather than focus on who is praying, make your condition known to the church. This is another thing that kills me. People find out that they weren't on the prayer list, okay? And then they get angry at the church. And somebody says, did anybody know Bob was in the hospital? Okay, and nobody knew. Bob, who did you tell you were in the hospital? Well, I don't know, okay? And Bob didn't tell anybody he was in the hospital. He's mad at people because they weren't praying for him, Okay. You do need to make your needs known, okay? So tell people if there's a problem or you need prayer. I think probably a bigger problem than that is people who need prayer who don't ask for prayer, okay, for whatever reason. But make your needs known. Uh, and know that the Lord will rally his saints to pray for you. You know, sometimes I'm compelled just to pray for people I don't know don't even know if they need prayer, and I pray for all the people who need prayer. David Schwab, in, in Wednesday night prayer, we, have, we, we pray unspokens, and if anybody who comes to the Wednesday night, the Wednesday night prayer meeting has, we call them unspoken requests, 
uh, prayer requests, and they, because of the confidentiality of the prayer requests, they can't share it with everybody, so they say, I have an unspoken. So we pray for those unspoken requests. And when Dave Schwab prays for those people, he always prays for uh, the children who are locked in a closet, okay, or under a table listening to their parents argue and fight, and people who are in harm's way, uh, shivering and, and, uh, and trembling out of fear. Okay? He doesn't know who those kids are. He doesn't know who those people are. He doesn't know who's about to be the victim of abuse, but he prays for them. You think God ignores those prayers? Of course not. Of course not. Let God rally the saints to pray for you and be encouraged by your faith in God. <laughs> Do not set yourself up for discouragement by trusting in the righteousness of men. Okay? Don't do that. So Paul lives with this awareness that he is not alone in these things because there are saints praying for him. And then he also expresses confidence in the presence of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul is keenly aware that God is with him. Now, let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a little bit because I grew up in a church where we acknowledged the Holy Spirit. We knew he was part of the Trinity, but we really never were given much of a theology about the Holy Spirit because the, the, the Spirit is so pervasive in what he does do. Uh, and uh, if you go to John chapter 14, uh, this is where Jesus is promising his disciples before his, uh, before his crucifixion that he is going to send them the Holy Spirit to be with them. In other words, he is, the Spirit is going to take his place uh, in them. And in verse 15 of John chapter 14, Jesus says this to his concerned disciples. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be where? In you. That is intimacy. And one of my points of the whole sermon we, as we move through it is, if we have that kind of an intimate spatial relationship with God through Jesus Christ because of the presence of the Spirit, what a tragedy it would be if we never cultivated a relationship with that person. He lives in us. There's no greater intimacy two persons can have with one another. Now, what will this spirit do according to what we just read? He will teach us all things. When you are in prison, you are a target for the lies of the evil one. Okay? And he will try to discourage you at those times. He will try to keep you where you are at because you are miserable, okay? And, and you feel separated from God. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. It's not where God wants you. And at those times, we need to be, well, what it also says. We need to be reminded of all the things that God has taught us. We need to embrace the truth that we have learned about God and his promises. This is one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do for us. If, you, if we go on in verse 26 of the same chapter, uh, we read, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, when I have been in these prisons, sometimes as I try to seek God's help, and don't get me wrong, I don't think this is necessary, necessarily an easy thing to do. I mean, sometimes God's presence overwhelms us 
and just lifts us up and warms us. It's almost like falling back in his arms and knowing that. But sometimes, even though he is with us, he seems so far away. That is typically not because of a problem with God that he is rejecting us. It's typically because something that's wrong in our own psyches, in our own sinful nature that is a, that, that has caused a barrier between us and him, usually sin of some sort. But that's why one of the things we do in order to be able to draw close to him is to start thinking about confess sin. What is it that is separating me from God right now? And we try to confess that, get it out of the way, so that we can draw closer to him at those times. And as we draw closer to him, then he will bring to mind the things that will bring us comfort and become, begin to open the doors of those prisons of thinking. Now, what else did Paul use to cope when he was in this situation in Rome? Well, Paul had a tremendous confidence that was born out of his faith. Uh, in fact, if you look at this portion of Scripture, the words just reek of confidence, uh, even the way it started. Yes, I will rejoice. This is what I am going to do. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will <laughs> turn out for my deliverance. I mean, does it sound like he's doubting as to whether or not he's going to be delivered? Does it sound like he's doubting whether or not things are going to turn out the way that God wants them to turn out? Not at all. He says, and it is my eager expectation, not just expectation. I have an eager expectation and a hope that I will not be ashamed and that with full courage, now as always, Christ be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Okay? Uh, that, the way he speaks just reeks of confidence. Now, uh, this is important. Many of you have been athletes. Many of you have coached. Many of you have taught. And you have probably noticed that if, you, if, a, if, if a child or even adult doesn't think they can, they probably won't. Would you agree with that? If a person, and they won't even try, okay? But if they don't think they can, they probably won't. Do you think Paul thinks he can? Yeah, it sounds like it, you know. But he also knows it's not dependent on his strength, okay? He is, you know, it is, it is the Lord who will be his faith. And his faith here comes not from him, but is something that the Lord has generated in him. Uh, uh, Vine, who is, uh, who is an author, he made a wonderful word study, a glossary of sorts that a lot of New Testament students like to use. It's, it's very user-friendly, by the way. If you're ever in a Christian bookstore, a lot of times you'll see vines on sale. Uh, pick one up and buy it. If you're going to the Bible, it'll give you English words and give you uh, a broad definition of those words in, in the English. But Vine indicates, uh, well, well, we'll go back up. Uh, in terms of this, in terms of this uh, uh, hope, okay, this, this eager expectation or the confidence, uh, he has cultivated a confidence in hope and that he will hope that he will not be ashamed. Hope that he will not be ashamed. Now I want to go back to Vines. I say, okay, what does this ashamed mean? Because it seems an odd thing as you're reading through it. I have hope that I'm not going to be ashamed. Now, Vine indicates that Paul is referring to the kind of shame that stems from something that he might do. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you have what we call besetting sins, but sins that you have fought most of your life, or maybe you've fought them for the last 10 years, and they always seem to be in front of you, but you always, it's, it's a constant battle. Anybody have any besetting sins? Good. Confession's good, okay? Pastor's got his hand up. You can put your hand up, okay? Uh, and sometimes, you know, we almost live with this sense that I'm going to do it again, okay? And when I do, it's always the same results. I'm ashamed, okay? And, I'm, and I feel guilt. It's overwhelming that has a positive effect on me because it keeps me away from that sin Again, until I drop my own guard, I get cocky and think that I can handle this now, and then boom, it comes back and hits me again. So this is the kind of, uh, he's talking about the kind of shame that comes from things that he may do. And he here has hope and confidence that he is not going to do them. I am not going to be ashamed. 
Vine also indicates that such shame must be associated with the judgment seat, okay? The end times for all who will stand before the Lord and answer for their sins. Now, we Christians know that our sins have been covered, but are we still going to stand before God in judgment? And the answer to that is yes. So what is your answer going to be when God asks you for accountability for your sins? Well, my answer is going to be, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I trust in his blood that saved me from my sin, okay? And I rest on his blood, okay? And, and that is my answer. And the judge will pound the gavel and say, time served, <laughs> okay? You're free, okay? Now, we have gotten away in our day and age of thinking about judgment, Okay? and the judgment seat and end times. We don't think about it much in our culture, but we're, an unusual, we're unusual in that way. Okay? Certainly in biblical times, that was a constant theme. And even back in terms of perhaps maybe two or three generations ago, this was a more common theme that people lived with. Every time they did something wrong, there was in the back of their mind is, I'm going to have to answer to this before the Lord. Okay? Even, I've noticed, sometimes non-Christians, I, I think God places these things in our hearts. We all know somehow, some way, there's going to be a price to pay. Now, that's one way of thinking about ashamed. I'll give you another, I'll give you another facet of this diamond here. Uh, other commentators, including James Montgomery Boyce, who's a, who's one of my favorite Reformed theologians, uh, he takes a little bit different tact on this, but there's still a so strong association with shame, and. Uh, he says this, is a ref this reference to shame is more closely related to disappointment, okay? Teaching that Paul is actually saying that the person who is not ashamed is the person whose trust has not been misplaced and who therefore is never disillusioned, Okay? You see that dichotomy there? Or not a dichotomy, that progression there? Uh, the person who is not ashamed is the person whose trust has not been misplaced. Therefore, they're not going to be disillusioned. In other words, we're only disappointed when we trust in that which will inevitably fail us. Okay? How many of you have trusted in something that inevitably failed you? This is hand-raising Sunday, okay? Okay? <laughs> Whether it be a person or an institution or a company or something, we put our trust in something we never should have put our trust in, and then they failed us. Then we became disillusioned with it. Uh, God will never fail us, so we never have to entertain the possibility of disappointment. And this is where Paul's confidence stems from. He is trusting in the one who will not disappoint. Shame comes when we trust in that which is untrustworthy and then failure results. Okay, let's go past that. That's pretty wordy. What else did Paul hope in? Where else was his confidence? It says, hope for full courage. Full courage. Meaning, in his situation, courage to stay the course and never give up. Courage rooted and strength of faith, believing in the promises of God. God says, Paul, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am here with you in this prison cell. I will accompany you through all of the hard times you have ahead. And Paul said, I believe you. And therefore, <laughs> if God is with me, who can be against me? Therefore, courage. In the face of, humanly speaking, overwhelming odds, and then he just doesn't say courage. He says full courage. Courage that does not waver, thus becoming vulnerable to attack and subsequent weakening. He has another hope, and it's a strong and a powerful hope. Hope that my body will bring honor to Christ, regardless of whether I live or die. And I think what Paul is doing here is saying, I'm a big word guy. You all know that, okay? I'm a yacker. I talk. I preach. I teach. I want my body to be consistent with what I've been saying to the day I die. Not in word only, but my faith in deeds also. 
It is one thing to talk about strength of hope and courage and faith and perseverance. It is quite another thing to practice them. Paul believed that coping with his situation went beyond words. He knew in that prison he needed to get up every morning, care for himself in prison the best that he could, eat what was given to him regardless of his appetite, care for anyone Christ allowed into his life with the love of Christ, obey the prison guards who were the authorities that God had placed over him in his life at that time. He knew he must be a good prisoner. That was his calling now, and he must endure physically as a testimony to the truth of the message of the gospel, which, continue, which he continued to proclaim to the praetorian guards in the Roman prison. We know later that he had a, that, that, that bore tremendous fruit in the ministry. His job now was to be a good prisoner and to endure physically. Many of you know I've spent a good deal of time in the hospital, not as much as some of you, but more than probably most. And when I was in the hospital, this is the mindset the Lord gave me. David, your role right now, you're not the pastor of Walnut Hill Bible Church. Your primary role is to be a good patient. Okay? That's what I have to do. I'm going to wake up this morning, and I'm going to be as good a patient as I possibly can be. I know from being in hospitals that there are a lot of rooms that... How many nurses are here this morning? Any nurses? Okay. I know that there were certain rooms that nurses didn't want to go into because of the patients in those rooms. I did not want my room to be one of those rooms. I wanted the nurses to look forward to come into my room because lying in my bed was Jesus. Okay. And I wanted them to interact with Jesus when they interacted with me. And I wanted to talk to them about their lives and what was going on in their lives. And I'm telling you, I had nurses stop in after work just to chat. Okay? It wasn't Dave Hutchins. It was the Holy Spirit that was willing to work through me in that situation. I even wanted to be Jesus when a phlebotomist walked towards me with three students <laughs> to put in a new IV. That wasn't easy, being a good Christian, as you were pinpricked all over the place. But that was my role, and I wanted God to use me there because that's where he put me. Was it a good thing that he put me there? Absolutely it was a good thing that he put me there. How do I know that? Because he's the one that put me there. Because Paul carried the name of Christ with him, he understood that his life could honor or dishonor the name that he bore, Paul, the Christian. That's why he was in prison, Paul, the Christian. Paul lived with a hope that all that he said and did would magnify the name of Jesus. Sometimes we think of our lives in subcategories. Kind of like a table of contents, as if we were a book. Uh, Chapter 1, my early years. Chapter 2, my profession. Chapter 3, my married life. Chapter 4, my life as a father. Chapter 5, my friends and relations. Chapter 6, my hobbies. Chapter 7, my religion. Okay? As if there's there's a separation between them. This model does not reflect Christian thinking. And it is a formula, I would argue, for misery and failure, opening virtually every aspect of our lives to influences that serve the father of lies. If you, if you dichotomize your life like that, this is what it's like. It's like buying a computer and then purchasing antivirus protection and only applying it to your Bible software, okay? Leaving the whole rest of the computer up for grabs with whatever nasty little thing gets in there. We are Christians. That prevails over, the, over everything that we are because chapter one should be my early years as a boy growing up in a Christian home. Chapter two, my life as a Christian professional. Chapter 3, my life as a Christian husband, my life as a Christian father, and, and so on. 
so that my Christianity permeates everything else that I am and I do. A lesson we should learn from Paul here is that he was keenly aware that God should be honored by the whole of his life, not just parts of it. And Paul wanted Christ to be seen through him. When prison guards looked at Paul, he wanted them to see Jesus. When Paul spoke to them, he wanted them to hear Jesus. He wanted them to be compelled to love him, and in loving him, they would love Jesus. And we know that that happened. When people observe us at work, let them see Jesus. When people look at our marriages, let them see Jesus, signifying unto us that union that we see between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Those of you who are married, you ever hear those words before? When people see us in the sports arenas, let them see Jesus. When people see us at school, let them see and hear Jesus. Jesus always glorified the Father. And as Christians, that's our calling. Paul did what he did regardless of whether or not he lived or died in the bowels of that prison. Why? Because ultimately it wasn't about Paul. It was about Jesus. For to him, as is true for all Christians, to live is Christ, permeating everything that we are and have. But to die, even better, even better. And we come to verse 21. To me, this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. And to me, it expresses the very heart of the Christian faith. For to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If a non-believer were to ask you, what is Christianity? What would you tell them? Don't say anything out loud, just think. What would you say? What is Christianity? I've heard many learned people give answers to that question. Some of them stumble. A lot of them just launch out on this long, rather complex uh, diatribe as to what they think Christianity is. Anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, theologians, historians, and so forth. Their answers are long and complex, usually because the ones I've heard, it seems clear after I listen to them that they do not know Jesus. They know a lot about what has been said about Jesus, and they know a lot about what people who call themselves Christians have done, but they don't know the heart of Christianity. They don't know Christ. You see, Christianity is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that grows from him is good and pure and true. The world is confused because they see what grows from our carnal hearts and they get that mixed up with Jesus. John Stott is one of my favorite Christian authors. He died last year. He was an Englishman, pastor at the church at Lord's Church, Lord's church in, in London, I should say. The per, and he writes this. He says, The person and work of Christ are the foundational rock upon which Christian religion is built. Take Christ from Christianity and you disembowel it. There is practically nothing left. Christ is the center of Christianity. All else is circumference. So anyone, when people ask you, what is Christianity? You've got to go to the center. You've got to talk about Jesus. If you don't know Christ, then you don't know true Christianity. If you don't know Christianity, then you're probably in no position to accept or reject it. Right? As a minister, this is not just me. I know the vast majority of the people in this room understand this. It is so sad to see individuals who have rejected Christ based on things that they associate with Christ that even Christ rejects. They form false conclusions about its essence based on wrong assumptions. 
James Montgomery Boyce in his uh, book on Philippians talks about a historical event that happened in October in 1967 when the Soviet Union launched a space probe designed to crash on the surface of Venus and send back vital statistics uh, about temperature and atmospheric pressure. That was the goal of the Michigan mission. Crash a space probe on Venus and see what the temperature of the planet was and, and measure the atmospheric pressure. The space probe ceased transmitting information 3,774 miles from the center of the planet. Presumably because it had struck the surface of the planet. The information about the probe gathered about the temperature and the atmospheric pressure seemed to all of the scientists in the world unquestionable at the time. And it suggested that there could be life on Venus. Well, now, in 2013, actually way before this year, uh, scientists have determined that the radius of Venus is only 3,759 miles, meaning that the Russian space probe ceased transmitting when it was still 15 miles above the planet's surface. Consequently, all of its figures were misleading, and it gave the temperature 15 miles above the planet's surface, but it did not provide the information that scientists most wanted to know. Sent back all this information, all this data, and everyone thought they knew all about Venus. In the same way, many thousands of well-meaning people stop receiving data while they're still miles away from the heart of Christianity. For many, their knowledge of Christ ends at those they meet who claim to be Christians. And many times these people who claim to be Christians are far from the heart of Christ. And they give those looking for Christ false data. And they reject him. Others get closer, perhaps into the church. And then they draw conclusions about Christianity based on the visible church, which is, as we know, a corruptible institution that reflects the flaws of humanity. Yes, the righteousness of Christ is found there in the hearts of people. But I tell you, if we decided whether or not we were going to embrace Christ based on what we saw on everyone who calls himself a Christian, probably almost everyone in this room would reject him, depending on who you met. Others get even closer, seeing the ceremonies and the programs and the beauty of the church that draws them. But ultimately, they too will not be satisfied because there's no life in those things. And after a while, it will seem dead. Others get to the written word, and they memorize it, and they can quote it. They can quote God's word, but they still have not yet come to know the living word of God, the author of the book, the person, Jesus Christ. You see, to really know Christianity is to know Jesus personally, relationally, to be able to speak with him knowing he is there, and to be able to listen for him as he speaks to us in his word with a confident anticipation, eager to know how he will lead, how he will love, how he will rebuke, how he will correct, how he will draw close. Personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that is life. That is intimacy. And for the believer... To live is to know Christ in that way. And to die draws us even closer. We're going to talk more about that next week. Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much.
Thank you so much for your word, for the promises that you give, Lord. And I pray for each individual in this room, no matter where we're at, Lord, for we're all seekers. Even after we find you, Lord, we must still strive to plumb the depths of a fathomless mind and heart. Lord, continue to help us to seek you so that we can know you. Your disciples, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, following you through this life and on to the next. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for calling us to yourselves. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.